Good afternoon. So, uh, let's see if this is actually working. No. Seems the computer has frozen in the meantime. Oh, there we go. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at the star field and two black holes in front of it. Uh, that's uh, through a general relativity simulation of uh, the event we discovered on uh, September the 14th, 19, last year. So what happened here, we have, we started off with two black holes uh, that uh, are running around each other. And whilst they're doing that, they're emitting gravitational waves. They're doing that very effectively in the last uh, 200 millisecond. This is uh, 200 milli roughly 200 millisecond of real time. This will slow down. This would take a lot faster. Uh, they're going around, the, towards the end, they're going around about 100 times a second. So what are we looking at here? Uh, 2016 is the 100 years of uh, centenary of gravitational waves. It's 100 years since Einstein predicted gravitational waves do exist. What are they? Uh, there are uh, ripples in space-time, and if you know electromagnetic waves, uh, a lot of things are very similar with gravitational waves. Uh, you need charges to produce them instead of uh, electrons or uh, protons, in this case, you typically have masses. Uh, you have a medium, which is free space, and uh, the only difference here, instead of an electric field, you actually have space itself. And the other difference is, we're not talking about dipole waves, we're talking about quadrupolar waves. So if you're looking at here, there are two polarizations as well. Uh, the wave would actually go perpendicular through this plane, and would stretch in one direction and shrink in the other direction. And then every half wave or wavelengths, it would basically pulsate like that. And the other polarization is just 45 degree rotated. So a Michelson interferometer is very good at measuring different differences between two arm lengths. So if you to put the Michelson interferometer with the vertex here and one arm here and one arm here, you have sort of a perfect instrument to measure this. Uh, this is the LIGO Livingston Observatories. So to actually measure these things, uh, this event we discovered was about a billion light years away. So it took a long time to get here. And you need a big interferometer to actually see it, a very high sensitive interferometer. And I go later on a little, why it has to be so big. Uh, this is our vertex building, and then you see an arm going down here, and this is a four kilometers, about three miles, and there's another arm of a Michelson interferometer going this way. Uh, the same, uh, we have a second observatory, and that's in Hanford. Uh, the, it's exactly sort of a carbon copy. Uh, the only difference is uh, the environment here is more a desert-like environment where it's much greener down south. Here is the event uh, as seen in the data as recorded by the LIGO Livingston. And uh, we're looking at a time trace. We, we are looking about uh, from here to here, the whole trace about 200 milliseconds. So we're basically just seeing the end point of this event. And what we're looking at here is that this is a filtered data in the sense filtered, we are, we are throwing all the high frequency stuff away and everything at a very low frequency that's not within the band of this event and the bandwidth of this event, same as maybe from 500 hertz to 200 hertz. Uh, and you see towards the end this little chirp, a sort of a sine wave uh, that moves up in frequency and gets bigger in amplitude. And how big is the amplitude we actually detected? It's one two hundredth of a proton radius. So that's sort of the sensitivity you need to detect an event as big as two colliding black holes. 
And very important for us, uh, you may ask, why are you sure this is coming from outer space, not something you just uh, produced uh, on Earth here, is the Hanford detector showed exactly uh, the same trace. So this is measured in coincidence. If you very carefully look, you see it a little bit time shifted because, of course, there's a time of flight between the two sides. Uh, the other thing that might convince you, if you look at this uh, curve that's drawn in here, uh, this is the predicted waveform, and you see it matches very well. Here we're looking actually, here we're actually listening to this event, and you can hear it, it's, uh, because it's 100 hertz, it's sort of a very deep rumble. And if we're uh, moving that up in pitch, you can sort of uh, see this uh, chirp waveform, so you can actually listen to these events. Uh, it's actually pretty cool, because it's, uh, at the end it's audio, it's the audio band uh, we're, the, we're uh, the analyzing. And this is sort of the summary of that event. Uh, basically, everything I saw before uh, in, in, in one plot. Uh, the only thing that's sort of added on is the residual down here in this plot. You can see that uh, between uh, predicted and measured, uh, the residuals are pretty uniform. <clears throat> this is the second event we detected on uh, December 26. This is uh, the second event. That's uh, rather different. It's also two black holes, but they're only around half the mass. That has the consequences that the event actually unfolds slower. So if you look at the time, we're now looking at an entire one second worth of data instead of 200 milliseconds. And uh, if you look at the data, you would the first order say, oh, I don't really see anything here. And that's true. You don't actually see that. Uh, in some sense, we were lucky with the first event because it was a very short event, so you see something in a time series. This is a much longer event, so you don't actually see it in the time series. You have to use matched filter techniques to actually dig it out. And uh, this is of the matched filter uh, output. And here you see the accumulated SNR of this event. And even in a time frequency domain, you can see it a little bit here and a little bit here. But again, uh, the second event, you actually need the data processing to find it and, and, and actually convince yourself that this is significant. Uh, this sort of depicts uh, what is happening here. We're, we're distinguishing three phases, uh, sort of an in-spiral phase where you can treat it sort of, sort of semi-Newtonian, where it just every round trip you lose a little bit of energy and go a little closer. Uh, further in, uh, you reach the merger phase uh, where you're so close you need full general relativity uh, math to actually describe it. And at the very end, uh, you form one big hole and that's sort of excited, so it sort of rings down. And that's sort of eigenmodes. And this is typically sort of uh, depicted here in exponential decay of its eigenmodes. Uh, this is, of course, a theoretical thing we have not actually, if you actually look in our data, we can actually not see that ring down uh, with enough significance uh, to say for sure there was a ring down. Uh, one thing we can do very well is, is to make the background of events. And what we're doing is we're just taking one data from Hanford and the Livingston data and shift it by one second. And if it's shifted by one second, then it can be something that comes in from, from outer space because it has to be within 10 milliseconds. So all, all these curves down here, the black curve and those blue curves are estimates of, black, of background. And uh, there are three events sort of shown here. This is the one we first saw. Uh, on the uh, 14th of September, and here is the second event on the 26th of December. And you can see here so maybe something. This is uh, more likely a real event than it isn't, but uh, if you look at the sig significance, it's sort of just below two sigma. It's maybe 80, 90% chance it's a real event, and uh, 10, 20% it isn't. Uh, the other thing you can see, there isn't really, uh, if you, if you just look at the background by time-shifted analysis. There will be 
event in there where you have the real event in one detector, uh, with, uh, where you have this event in one detector and time shifted in the other detector, some noise, some little bit of excess noise. Because you can do this time shift often and you can do a, a ton of them compared to the real data. So all these events down here, if you actually analyze it, there's always one of them is this big event and the other one is a background event in the time shifted data in the other detector. So you can say, okay, I just remove this event from the data. I just take the data, but this event and see how the background looks like. And then you get this blue line here. And you see you basically, rem that removes all these events. There is no background in our data of other events, uh, events that were just in one detector and in other detector and by chance if you time shift. There's, no, there's not a lot of single events and we just pick two that happen in coincidence. There are no events that look like these events in our data, uh, neither in a single detector and certainly not in coincidence. The only two and a half events we have are these two and a half that are shown there. This is zoomed in uh, at the bottom, just looking at those uh, two lower events. You can do the same trick again with the background, with the event, with the background, with the, without the event. And you can see whenever you use, remove the event from the data, the remaining background looks uh, very benign. There's nothing there. So this is sort of a, a picture of all the bl black holes that are known or were known. These are black holes and their masses uh, as seen by X-ray studies. You can look at, uh, in, if you have a black hole and there's matter around it that uh, is falling in and that emits uh, X-rays of a characteristic frequency and you can study that and deduce there's a black hole. You can even sort of deduce how big it is. Uh, so these are the black holes LIGO so, uh, and you see one big thing is, and they're a lot bigger, uh, a lot of them are a lot bigger than these ones. And the first one are two black holes around 30 solar mass that made a 60 solar mass black hole. Uh, the second event on, uh, in December was uh, black holes about half the size, around 10 solar mass black holes made in 20 solar mass, and that uh, third iffy, maybe more iffy event uh, is sort of in between. <clears throat> this is the type of physics you can do. You can actually now study the waveform. You can match different waveforms. So you can look at individual masses of different things. You can look at uh, spins. You can look at distances. Uh, you can look at uh, sky maps. And the way we are determined the sky map or where it comes from is simply by triangulation. Basically, we see the one event comes a little earlier in one detector than the other detector, and we know it comes from this direction. And then, obviously, you immediately uh, deduce uh, with uh, two detectors. You can't really make very well triangulation. You need three detectors, and that's, uh, I'm going to talk about that in, uh, towards the end. But yeah, with two detectors, you typically get sort of a ring or half a ring on the sky where the thing comes from. And this calculates also backwards in our parameter estimate how the source looks like. There's some degeneracy with distance and inclination angle and things like that. Here are uh, just the values as determined uh, from the data analysis team. These are all 90% error. And one thing you have, have to see is actually we're, we're actually determined these masses of these black holes quite uh, accurate. Uh, it's almost a precision measurement in masses, and these masses are very, very far away. They're about a billion years away. Uh, both of these events are about the same distance. Uh, this one is uh, this uh, third event, this, the little event is a little further away. The other thing that's remarkable, if you, if you actually look at the numbers here, this is the primary black hole, the secondary black hole, and then the final black holes, and if you do the math, uh, it doesn't quite add up. What's missing is radiated energy. And here is how much ra energy is radiated. So this first event we saw radiated three solar mass of energy in about 200 milliseconds. This is by far the brightest event uh, ever seen on the sky.
There's a couple other things you can do. You can do, of course, a GR test, see how well it is, Let's see whether Einstein was right. Uh, usually what uh, people like to talk about is the graviton. Everybody has heard about the graviton, even though nobody's ever seen one. Uh, what is the graviton? That's uh, supposedly uh, a quantum particle that uh, corresponds to gravity. And if it has a mass, then gravitational waves don't propagate the speed of light. Actually, you get a dispersion, dispersion depending on the frequency of the gravitational waves. And you can look at that. You can look at our signal and see is there any, do we see a dispersion of the signal? Is this stuff that uh, uh, higher frequency really slower than lower frequency? And that's not true. So we can actually uh, set the limit on the graviton mass. We don't, don't see anything. Uh, what we see is totally consistent with general relativity. Uh, the way Einstein wrote it down. So we can only set an upper limit, uh, and you can either lose it in the mass or you can look in the Compton wavelengths. And it's now actually better than the limits uh, deduced by either the double pulsar system or the solar system limits. That just was the first event we saw. So now switching a little bit of gear, we're actually talking a little bit about the detector and how that looks like. So after all, this is an optical engineering talk, supposedly. Uh, so the Michael's in the Vrahmer got a little, a couple additional pieces. Uh, you probably still recognize uh, the fundamentals. Here is the beam splitter. Uh, there is one end test mass, uh, and there is another end test mass. Uh, one thing we are, we are doing, we are, each arm is an optical cavity an optical resonator, and the light is sort of spooled up about a factor of 100 times. So the enhancement factor is sort of 100, 200 times. Why are we doing that? A gravitational wave at 100, uh, the 100 hertz, uh, the antenna length, the optimal antenna length is like an electromagnetic, a quarter wavelength. A quarter wavelength is a lot longer than four kilometer. Uh, it's like 400 kilometer. Uh, but same like in electromagnetic, you don't have to have the antenna in one string. You can just wind it up. It still works. And that's the same thing we're doing. We're basically, uh, we could use a delay line, uh, but the delay line uh, requires rather large mirrors because you have multiple bonds or so a lot of mirrors. So what we're using is an optical cavity. So we're basically uh, enhancing the path lengths by a factor of 100, roughly. Uh, the other thing uh, which is added on is this, we call this the power recycling mirror. Uh, why is this? Uh, we start off with a laser uh, in, in, in the one that was running uh, during this detection, uh, put out about 20 watt. And it's a 200 watt laser, but we only learned how to use about 20 watts of it. We're currently working on increasing that laser power. Um, but if you have a very good optics here, then this is a total reflector. This is, of course, a partially reflector to make this optical resonator. Uh, when you send in the light, most of the light gets sent right back to you. So most of the light, about 99%, uh, comes right back at you and then the beam split. We're not actually watching fringes. Obviously, two hundreds of a proton radius, is, is, you, you can't do that by just counting fringes because the fringe is, uh, is a quarter wavelength. So, that's more like a quarter micrometer. So what we are doing is we're running this, we're locking, of course, the cavities, and we're also locking the beam splitter very close to a dark fringe. And say for, for the simplicity, we're locking it on a dark fringe. So there's no light going down here. That means 99% of the light you're shooting in shoots right back at the laser. So you can put another optical cavity in here by putting this power recycling mirror and, and building it up. So uh, in theory, this should give us an enhancement of the power on the beam split by a factor of 50. In reality, we achieve about 30 to 40. Uh, this, of course, makes that the instrument a lot more complicated to control because now we have two arm cavities, a dark fringe condition here on a beam splitter, plus this power recycling cavity and a coupled cavity. They all have to be held on resonances. And some of the photo detector uh, you see here and here uh, are responsible uh, to keep you on the, the fringe. 
Uh, we're using an RF technique, uh, pant river hole reflection locking, or variance thereof, uh, to do our error signals. So there is a, typically a puckle cell at the beginning. Uh, in advanced LIGO, we're using two modulation frequencies, 9 and 45 megahertz. Uh, they are different than the main carrier light. The main carrier light is resonant here on the arm cavity. Uh, the 9 megahertz sideband is only resonant in this vertex cavity. It doesn't actually penetrate the arm, so there's a difference there. Uh, where you can send the waveform difference uh, between those two 9 megahertz on the carrier, uh, the main laser light. And the 45 megahertz is also resonant here, but also has a significant uh, footprint to this port. And uh, to make it even more complicated, we put yet another mirror in, which we call the single recycling mirror. And that mirror has to do uh, to enhancing our signal. You can think of it, the signal gets produced by, by, by say, a black hole that moves. One of these tests measures a little inwards, the other one a little outwards. It means there's a little light coming out. Uh, you can send that light right back in and enhance it uh, through a cavity buildup. So you basically get an enhancement factor in your signal strengths. Or uh, the other way you can do it, uh, and that's how we're actually doing it, you can make the finesse of these arm cavities very high and then use this mirror to effectively lower uh, the transmissivity or, of these mirrors and have a lower finesse or a wider bandwidth of the signal coming out here. And one thing we're always distinguish here is common mode and differential mode. So we're always thinking now, so the bandwidth in the common mode is not the same. If you look at the bandwidth in common mode with this power recycling cavity, uh, it takes, it's about half a hertz. So the time constant to unloading this cavity and loading is about a second. And uh, of course, this is way too low for our 100 hertz bandwidth we want for the gravitation wave. So we're actually increasing the bandwidth using this mirror, but only in the differential mode. Here's a, a picture of a test mass suspension. Uh, this is very complicated. That's probably the first thing you see what the hell is going on here. So the test mass is this thing down here. There's actually something in front of it in, in this for, for inspection purpose. So you're, you're, you know, there's sort of a little plastic thing. Um, here is sort of more, how it, sort of more picture. The cage around here is mainly here to prevent the thing from falling down if something should happen. And the reason uh, this is so complicated, we want to have a suspended mirror. Because we, of course, cannot bolt this mirror to the ground because the ground shakes all the time. There's seismic activity. The ground shakes by sort of a micrometer all the time uh, at low frequency. That would be much bigger than the signal we look at. So we need to seismically isolate this. And the easiest way to seismically isolate it is just make a pendulum. There's about a, a meter long pendulum between this mass and this mass, and if you move the you know, if you move below the pendulum frequency in the top mass, then the whole thing moves. And if you move a lot faster up here in the pendulum frequency, then it moves the top, but the bottom doesn't really move that much. So that's how you isolate uh, uh, a test mass. And because it works so well, you just make another one up here. Uh, so you make a quadruple pen. In this particular case, we have a quadruple pendulum. And uh, there are a couple of uh, blades in here, uh, vertical blades, springs, to go also give you uh, uh, vertical isolation. So this should give you about uh, I think seven orders of magnitude suppression of 100 hertz of the seismic ground. That's not enough by itself. This is just one stage of seismic isolation. Uh, the, the mirrors are relatively large. Uh, they are 40 centimeters in diameter. Uh, there are two reasons why they are relatively large. One reason is the beams are relatively large. I mean, laser beams are all considered small, but of course, if you want to have a diffraction limited laser beam on four kilometers, it's not that small anymore. Uh, the other thing is, uh, during the last run, we had about 100 kilowatts of light on these mirrors. Uh, Eventually, we want to have run that up to close to a megawatt. 
So photon radiation pressure is no longer a small effect. Uh, it actually pushes your mirror significantly. You actually get noise due to the radiation pressure fluctuations that we could see. Because there's a difference. Radiation pressure acts on the in-test masses in X and in Y, and it does it slightly different. So you can actually have a differential displacement just with the randomness of the photon impinging on the test masses. So you want to have a heavy mass there that doesn't move uh, due to radiation pressure. So here is actually a test mass. And typically, it's both simple and demanding. Simple in the sense it's just a mirror, uh, a cylinder. But we want to have some rather challenging uh, numbers here and specification. First of all, it's relatively large, and it has to be very low absorption material. So we are looking at uh, bulk absorption less than 0.2 ppm per centimeter. That's mainly for the input test masses where the laser beam actually has to pass through. And of course, thermal degradation, if the thing is heating, you get thermal lensing. Uh, we want to avoid that. We also don't, like, don't want to have a lot of scattering because you want to have a high finesse cavity and every light that's scattered out of the uh, instrument is lost to us. So we, to re minimize uh, losses and increase performance, uh, we have scatter, total scatter, not more than 10 ppm. Uh, the, the surface figure we start off is sort of a nanometer, less than a nanometer RMS over, uh, I think, about 200 millimeter in the center here. It's actually so good, this, uh, the micro roughness now, that you cannot maintain that with the coatings. The, the mirrors themselves, the bulk material is actually better. Once you put an optical coating on it, it's actually getting slightly worse. The other thing, in the end test masses, uh, we want to have a very high reflector. So the transmission is only about 4 ppm. Uh, the other thing, of course, uh, the focal length of these mirrors has to be pretty long. So it's about 2 kilometers each. A slightly different between the end test mass and input test masses. Here is a vacuum system. You cannot have this system in air because then, of course, all the turbulence is acoustic. So there's a fairly large vacuum system. Um, let me quickly run So this is a, what we call a beam splitter chamber. There is the vertex where the beam splitter is. And here you see a sort of a ladder. I see how big that is. Uh, if you stand here on the floor, the beam line is roughly around here in the middle of the chamber. And that's just about eye height. That's about this high. So, so this entire quadruple pendulum is inside in these chambers. Uh, the next chamber over here is one of the input test masses, another input test masses, and then, and then it goes about four kilometer this direction and four kilometer this direction to the end test mass. I think the laser is back here. You can't really see it. And the anti-symmetric port is back here. This is a seismic isolation system. Uh, not only do we have uh, the quadruple pendulum, we actually have an active isolation system. Uh, in this particular case, this is sort of constructed, if you go back here, upside down. So you see these blue piers, and then there are bellows where you go into the vacuum. So the seismic isolation system is actually up here, and then this quadruple pendulum is attached from the bottom. So it sort of has hanging down. And this seismic isolation system is a little hard to understand because it's also a, a double pendulum, but it's sort of constructed inside, outside. So you don't really know which part uh, is moving against which part. Uh, you see a little bit of vertical blade springs going in here, and here another set of pelican blade springs. So this is a different stage. Those two stages are not actually direct, you know, they're not actually uh, attached, they're just attached through a pendulum stage. And that was mainly done due to uh, just space restrictions to be able to fit in the chambers. The chambers predate the design of that seismic isolation system. That should give us another 
five orders of magnitude of isolation at 100 hertz. Here is an input optics, uh, some of the optics in the input chain. I think this is uh, probably a thing we call an input more cleaner. Uh, this is only a triple, uh, triple suspension, and here we have the sort of what we probably more used to is an optical table and the seismic isolation from above. Uh, the other thing, I think uh, all these people here that in, in is uh, bunny suits, uh, as with any of these uh, precision experiments, uh, dust is your enemy. This is a laser table. Uh, we have, this looks like the high power stage that can output up to a 200 watt here, injection locked. Uh, we have a MOPA here, uh, about output about uh, 50 watts. Here's the control room. Of course, these days it's mainly computer. So explaining a little bit uh, about the challenges in actually measuring that sensitivity. This is uh, the noise curve as measured uh, during that run that in the last September, October, November. So we're looking here at the frequency. We're making a Fourier analysis of that uh, time series we're getting out of the detector. The one thing we're seeing, there's a huge mountain down here. We're not really measuring 200 of a proton radius absolute because at very low frequency, uh, below 10 hertz, we don't, we're sort of dominated by the remainder of the seismic uh, system. Uh, this goes, keeps on going up and up and up and up and uh, until it hit about a micrometer as a sort of the micro seismic activity at 0.1 hertz. But at about 100 hertz, uh, we need to reach uh, a couple of 10 to minus 20 meter per root hertz. And what are the noise sources we care about? Uh, one of them is shot noise. Uh, this is sort of depicted here as quantum noise. Uh, quantum noise includes both radiation pressure noise and shot noise. Up here, it's shot noise. Uh, you probably remember shot noise should be flat. And it actually is flat on the detector, but the reason uh, why it goes up here is because you're plotting here uh, noise over sensitivity. So the sensitivity goes down at higher frequency. That's just because the size of the antenna. Uh, for frequency at a kilohertz, the antenna is in principle too large, so you start losing uh, sensitivity. So we have shot noise that's sort of flat in the detector and, and curves up here to the sensitivity of the instrument. And, and here, as I alluded to, down here, the rise here is due to radiation pressure. These are actually uh, the mass moving to, to a radiation pressure noise. Thermal noise, uh, this is, tends to be the, the green curve here. Uh, one thing, this is not the final sensitivity of advanced LIGO, this is just the sensitivity we had. We think that the design of advanced LIGO sensitivity has another factor, two or three more sensitivity gain to be had. And here you see sort of where you bang your head eventually so sort of this thermal noise. Thermal noise is any sort of Brownian noise or noise where you basically couple to the heat path outside. In this particular reason is the coating themselves. So if you, if you have the coating on top of these test masses and uh, you, the laser beam or you know, the gravitation pushes on it a little bit, it deforms. That deformation uh, will, will couple, has a little bit of loss because there's friction and that friction uh, is, 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 is couples you to the heat path on the outside. That's sort of the same effect. Whenever you have losses, that means you're coupling yourself to the heat path from the outside, and that's where the noise comes in. You sort of open the door there, and that door basically will ultimately limit us. And that's the main reason why these instruments are so long. So you can certainly make the thing shorter, and instead of winding the antenna up a hundred times, it's just making it ten times shorter and wind it up a thousand times and 
from, uh, from the photons and for the gravitational wave sensitivity, it's exactly the same. But it's not the same for, is for the thermal noise, because the thermal noise is something uh, that affects the mirror. And of course, if you're winding it up, you, you're adding that noise a thousand times. So if you make this instrument uh, 10 times shorter, uh, the shot noise and the radiation pressure noise uh, are still where they are. But the radiation pressure noise probably comes up because you're winding it up more, so with higher power. Uh, but the thermal noise just jumps up a factor of 10 because you sampling the same noise 10 times more often. So the longer you make this instrument, uh, the less sensitive you are to displacement noise by these mirrors. So. Uh, gravitational wave observatories uh, alluded to in this last run had two observatories working here in Hanford and Livingston. What we really want is at least a third one. Uh, and I think the Virgo project is a three kilometer project in, in, in Europe. They're pretty close uh, in commissioning and hopefully they're gonna be online early next year. Uh, with three detectors like that, uh, if we can see all one event in coincidence, we can actually do reasonable triangulation and actually tell you sort of where it comes from. And it's not exactly optical resolution with arc seconds, uh, it's probably still uh, a square degree. But at least we, we roughly, it's not enough to identify the galaxy where it comes from, especially not if it uh, comes uh, from that far a distance. Uh, but it might be, if you see a transient, uh, might be enough to associate a transient with that. There are other projects here depicted. Uh, GEO 600 is a 600 meter uh, prototype that's online since quite a while. That's probably, uh, that's probably has uh, fulfilled its lifetime. Uh, a new uh, detector gets also, is also getting built in uh, Japan, the Kagura detector. Uh, they're also uh, building this. I think still a couple years away from actually running. And uh, we have a project to uh, put a third LIGO detector in India, uh, at which point we can have uh, good sky resolution. And how much, you know, even with the Hanford, Livingston, and Virgo, you, you have good sky resolution. You're looking here at the sky, and these are the patches you could uh, determine with a single noise of 10 event, how well, how big is the patch. And you see there's, a, there's lots of places where you don't have very good uh, angle of resolution because it's just sort of in a, in a blind spot of one of the interferometers, and then, of course, the other two can't really resolve it very well. Uh, if you add a fourth detector, like uh, the Indian detector or the Kagura detector, uh, you, you can make good sky resolution everywhere on sky. So with four detectors, you have, have good coverage. With the fifth detector, you also have some redundancy because this is a very complicated instrument. There's always a chance that one is done, one is in commissioning, uh, or one needs, is in an improvement phase. So one thing uh, we're doing is we're staging observation runs and improvements. Uh, that's how we commission these instruments. And this is sort of a, a picture that was done quite a while ago uh, where we uh, sort of, as a planning document, where we sort of thought, you know, how good are we, how good we need to be, and when are we running? Uh, Whenever your significantly, when your instrument is significantly better than, the, than whatever your previous sensitivity, it's worth running again. Uh, and the reason is we're measuring the amplitude of the gravitational wave. So if you're making an improvement of two in sensitivity, that means we're seeing twice as far, which meaning because we are not very well uh, looking at a very narrow angle like a telescope, but more or less the half the sky, uh, we're seeing eight times the number of sources. So you can easily do, we, we were running for three, four months and we also have two sources. If we can actually uh, make this twice as sensitive, which we haven't quite done yet, uh, then we would see eight times two, 16 sources for the same time. So, so it's always worth thinking about how you can improve the detector because you can cut down the time you need to measure significantly. Down here in the black curve is sort of uh, 
original uh, design sensitivity when this uh, project was initially proposed. Uh, the early run, which the first observation run, uh, which we concluded last year, uh, was sort of uh, envisioned to be in this range. It turned out to be, we were pretty much at the lower end here of this range, uh, around 80 megaparsecs. That's the range uh, for our standard candle. Uh, that's two neutron star. We can see black holes a lot further because they're a lot bigger and they're radiating a lot more energy. So we can uh, see black holes to a gigaparsec, but uh, neutron stars here, 1.4 solar masses, we can see 80 megaparsecs. So the second observation run is planned to start this fall, uh, and we are currently preparing for that. Uh, so the range is set to 80 to 120 megaparsec. And uh, again, should be sort of a three to six months run, and hopefully uh, at least partially together with the Virgo in the forearm, and so we can actually get a good sky position. And then there's also plans here in 2017 for the third run, uh, 120, 170 megaparsecs. And, and over here is the same picture uh, with the Virgo detector. They're a little bit behind relative to us in commissioning, uh, and, and, and they're having different stages how they do the commissioning, so their sensitivity changes significantly from one stage here, uh, from the early stage uh, to the late stage. And sort of uh, coming to an end here, uh, sort of just sort of a little bit of an outlook. Uh, next generation, once ever, whenever something works in physics, of course, you're always thinking about the next big thing. Uh, moving on, uh, so uh, the current facility, we currently uh, want to certainly run the current facility certainly until 2020. That's basically already planned in the budget, whatever you want to call it, uh, and, and make full use of the investments we have done. Beyond 2020, uh, we are think, currently thinking about an upgrade and with newer technology like squeezed light, uh, we can think of uh, have a factor two improvement over the design sensitivity. And 2013 is a time scale you, you might be thinking of using a cryogenic detector. Uh, cryogenic is, of course, very difficult. Uh, sure, it would be nice to have a millikelvin mirror uh, because that would sort of eliminate all the thermal noise question. But of course, having a mirror cooled to millikelvin and the megawatt of light uh, on it, those two things don't work together. So nobody talks about millikelvins. Uh, we're talking about uh, 10 kelvin, maybe 5 kelvin in extreme cases, but that that's difficult. The other thing that the cryogenic is not such a good idea is that uh, the amorphous material, like a few silica, which all our test masses currently consist of, actually the losses increase as you go to lower temperature. And that has to do that they have uh, translational degrees of freedom. And you get sort of a Debye peak at maybe 10 Kelvin or something like that. So, so if you actually go down a factor 10 in temperature, you're not actually winning. It's true uh, that the KT goes down, but the loss angle itself goes up, they're compensated, and they basically end up with almost zero gain. So you really have to go to Kelvin's to see it, or you have to change, change the test masses to a crystalline material, uh, which you could do if you change the wavelengths too, and do something like silicon. But of course, we're talking a lot of changes that's why uh, this is a 2013 time frame and it's not going to happen very soon. If you think even beyond that, uh, once, once you're, uh, say, 15, 20 years in the future, you probably want to have a new facility. And, and here is sort of a, an early plot of what, what that might look like. And you say, okay, I have a four kilometer facility, let's just make it 10 times bigger. Obviously, this is a very would be a very large interferometer and also a very expensive interferometer. But you can see that, that the sensitivity gets better almost every time you increase the length by factor two, you basically almost get a factor two in sensitivity improvement. 
it doesn't quite work beyond 40 kilometers like that anymore. And it sort of tethers out a little bit. But up to 40 kilometers, you can actually win. Even with the current technology, if you make it bigger, the thermal noise goes down. Uh, you get a little more length, and the antenna works better, so you get better sensitivity. And there are two projects. I don't know if I have a project or concepts. Maybe more likely you should call them Einstein Telescope is a European thing that has already a couple of years of study behind that. That's a 10 kilometer thing. And here in the US, we're thinking of something like Cosmic Explorer that's 40 kilometer long. And one thing you can do if you actually manage to get a 40 kilometer instrument like that, you can see every black hole merging in the entire universe. Thank you.